Service Lab is a community of service design doers and the service design curious. We meet up every few months to share our learnings with each other. So Stu is the founding director of Impact Sense, and we're really excited to have him at Service Lab tonight because he's going to be talking to us um, about CX performance metrics, and I'm sure we've all got quite a lot of views about uh, different metrics. So it'd be really good to kind of hear from Stu about this, and then question <laughs> afterwards. Over to you, Stu. Cool. Thanks. Um, so yeah, as the guy said, uh, my name is Stu. Uh, one of the founding directors of Impact Sense. So the guy underneath me right there is my son. Uh, I have two kids. This is the trouble one. Uh, so this is an upfront disclaimer. If he makes an appearance, I'm sorry in advance. Uh, and if all else fails as a cute kid to, to kind of like empathize with me better. Um, to give you a quick bit of context, Impact Sense uh, is an inside business. So we help basically clients get to know people better. Um, we do that through use of either our experience management platform that we have, or we have a collection of kind of research services which cover everything from traditional market research through to our kind of AI libraries that we have, which kind of help us with creating structured data sets. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the kind of I guess the growing disconnect that we've seen anyway uh, between practitioners at every level within business uh, and leadership teams when it comes to arguably the most important factor in design and CX landscape at the moment, uh, accountability. So there's kind of measurement factors we were talking about today. Um, so we did uh, some research with a whole host of CX professionals earlier in the year to try to really understand where everyone's heads are at when it comes to proving the effectiveness of their approach, uh, generally in the kind of sphere of design and CX. Now, the headline stat that came out for this, for want of a better word, is pretty horrific. Um, sorry, first person up, so I should probably keep it a bit lighter than this, but there you go, sorry. Um, so we found basically that only 4% of organizations know how to improve their customer experience from the key CX metric they use, 4%. So to me, that's pretty crazy, although I don't know if I was that surprised. Because, um, you know, for me, it's like surely we're capturing performance metrics to A, see how we're doing. Uh, but be more importantly to kind of set a direction of travel and to kind of influence change and ultimately to kind of drive pro progress so that when we capture that metric again, the number looks better and we can all kind of breathe a collective sigh of relief and then repeat the process again. But what we found is this, as I said, the fundamental disconnect between how we report performance and then how we prioritize and implement change. And nowhere is this really more important than in the design community. Um, if we look at the kind of leaderboard of the most uh, widely adopted metrics, uh, this kind of top line level that we talk about, we can kind of understand a little bit of why. Um, most businesses that you'll find will measure at least two of these things. Uh, and the majority of cases, they're really done in isolation of each other or in competition with one each other. Well, sorry. Um, if you're just looking at your NPS score, your net promoter score, then you're really kind of only looking at someone's propensity to recommend. And that really kind of relies on a human's ability to predict their own behavior, which we're not very good at. So there's kind of floor number one. I'll move on to a few others in a moment. But um, when it came to CSAT, we found that whilst it was the kind of most respected metric of the bunch, it scored a kind of 48% of the sample rating it as something they valued within their business. But the problem that we have with CSAT is that it's quite outcome focused. And when we talk about that outcome, it's kind of commonly associated with a very short time period, rather than looking from a kind of more holistic relationship standpoint. Um, but as with all these things, satisfaction can often be very open to interpretation as well. My satisfied is very different from your satisfied. So it kind of depends on that individual experience of a single customer. So it's quite hard to then scale that insight into a credible quantitative base. Um, when we talk about CLV or customer lifetime value, that's the kind of the accountant's dream. That's the, the kind of looking at the monetary value a customer brings to your business. But what that does is it creates a kind of limiting environment where you're focusing on short tail enhancements that might, while they might kind of shift your bottom line now, they're not really making kind of strategic bigger bets that leverage the power of your more emotive pool. So it's very functional. Um, finally, SUS scores or system usability scores. Um, granted, this is very popular amongst UX and CX practitioners. I'm sure a lot of you are big fans. Um, because of the way it's quite kind of matter of fact and the scoring systems are, and it removes some of that propensity towards bias, but the kind of limited scoring range that it has is a kind of minus one, zero or one, something either has an answer to the question or it doesn't. Um, it doesn't do much for flexibility and it kind of makes it difficult to assess the true impact of the change that you would have because you know there's not really a wide spectrum between the numbers that you're seeing. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna talk in a little bit more depth around the most popular of these metrics, which is MPS and the impact it's having on the freedom the kind of design community is given uh, to be that driving force of change within a business. 
Um, I think it's probably important to talk about this because it's basically somewhere in the region of 60 to 70 percent of Fortune 1000 companies adopt NPS as their primary strategic metric. So it's a kind of it's a big thing. But whether it deserves that position, I'm sure you'll have your opinion, and I have mine. But I have a microphone, so I can tell you what mine is. Um, so, and again, forgive me if I'm teaching you to suck eggs here. But the basic premise of NPS is that you're asking a customer a single question to understand how loyal they are to your business. Uh, in the hope that you kind of can equate that to some financial figure later on down the track. And then what you do is you take the percentage of those scoring you between 0 and 6 away from those scoring you a 9 or a 10. I will concede that uh, in a controlled environment, the maths does check out. You can look at that and go, okay, if, if we shift this, then our revenue will shift. Uh, and in some industries like in telco, uh, they're making great strides in using NPS by creating driver models around them to actually figure out what is causing that shift in NPS scores. Uh, but it is definitely not the case in all verticals and something hopefully you guys can see as well. Um, one problem that we find, like, especially in a country like the UK, we've kind of shown ourselves time and time again to be pretty pessimistic as a people. Uh, and to me, seven or eight is good. <laughs> like, I'm pretty happy with something if I rate it an eight. I mean, university would have been pretty dark for me if 80% didn't get a positive reaction. Um, like I got 8%. Um, so already you can see how there's a second behavioral element coming in that causes problems within the methodology. Um, now, if we look at the question, in its purest sense, it kind of, it's, it, this is it here. So on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend our business to a friend or colleague? But the thing is, people don't necessarily want to use the whole question. Some people want to take out the beginning part to make it a bit shorter and easier to digest. Some people don't want to talk about their business. Some people want to talk about their products. Others don't necessarily think it's available to kind of talk about a colleague, so they'll talk about a family member. Um, and then when we look at how it's actually kind of visually applied in the real world, some people like to change the scale, like you can see with Windows here, which has my, my favorite comment underneath. Uh, that says, I need you to understand that people don't have conversations where they randomly recommend operating systems to one another. Um, the main point there is not that comment, it's actually the one to five rating. Uh, again, with Apple Watch, you're seeing here, the question is much longer. And then finally, the most extreme example on the right-hand side here is a little bit pixelated, but you can kind of see the point at the bottom there, which is some people are changing the rules completely. They're flipping the scale, they're changing the question, adding in some colors just to say, hey, give us a gold, please. You know, they've, they've segmented that number scale down into things that are basically trying to nudge you to behave in a certain way. And I guess the point I have is that when you start to play with the way the question is asked, you're messing with the maths because you're changing the variables in the system. Or even worse than that, you're influencing behavior, the example to the right there that you can see. So the results are different. I and mean, then the number one thing that MPS is often used for is kind of benchmarking yourself against your competition. But when the conditions are different, a comparison becomes kind of somewhat invalid. So in the same way that if you're doing something to influence the outcome, why are you kind of really bothering to capture in the first place? It becomes not about your product or service. It comes about how well you can force people to ask a question, answer a question in a certain way. Um, so what does all this have to do with design? I would argue everything because of the result of these situations. Um, the climate kind of comes out in a number of different ways. So point number one here is I'm sure a number of you will have heard similar stories to these quotes that you can see before. These are from the research that we did. So either from the survey itself or from uh, the associated kind of roundtable sessions we, we held with a bunch of different verticals. Um, these metrics aren't famously good at connecting up to the real cause of the issue. They can kind of be captured uh, too late or during a completely different part of a customer journey. Um, and what they create is a kind of climate of assumption. Um, so from a design standpoint, this means that you're gonna often tweak something because of a shift in a score that you've seen. When the kind of reality and the true effect of the last round of changes you've made won't have even shown up in the data yet. People make these kind of snap decisions of going, well, our NPS has dropped 20 points. Um, and they're using something that's not live really to make those decisions because these things are lag metrics. They take time to actually manifest in the real world. Um, secondly, there's a huge play on culture because you can tweak methodologies to kind of positively or negatively impact your scores. Metrics are often used to justify business decisioning, which as I said is fine if you're connecting the dots in the right way. That means the design process can get pushed down the line uh, of priority and is seen as much more as a thing to do with production rather than for the strategic value it can bring to an end-to-end -end process. <clears throat> and this is often down to kind of siloed ownership. You know, people would say, I own NPS and strategy, you own CX and design. I'll tell you what needs to be done and you do it. And what this does from a CX standpoint is to create a climate where real design thinking and CX led approaches become this sort of binary thing that can be switched on or switched off and seen as working or not working, rather than something that's actually properly woven into the fabric of an organizational culture. 
Um, finally, there's something I think is probably the culmination of the previous two points, but credibility. So unfortunately, the common outcome that we saw from participants in our study is that things were measured from the perspective of kind of basic analytics because they didn't really know how to attribute it to MPS, but they wanted to put some kind of data around it, but didn't really ladder up into a clear headline that grabbed the attention of those at the top of the business. And that creates an environment where the two elements begin to compete with one another. So on the one hand, you have the design work that you're doing and the associated analytics around that that might well show an increase in performance. But if the other hand, which is your kind of leading CX metric, isn't showing an equal or greater increase, then for some reason, businesses seem to question the credibility of the design and its implementation. Um, you know, people will ask, you know, if it's so good, why aren't we seeing a shift in NPS or CSAT scores? And this is obviously a frustrating state of affairs because um, it's one that really appears to be all too common, um, but it doesn't really make that much logical sense. Um, so what can you do to kind of avoid all these things? Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where kind of any of the things I've mentioned before ring true, I'd suggest there's sort of four things you need to be kind of pushing for to avoid the pitfalls. Um, so firstly, make sure that any performance measurement frameworks are built holistically. So what I mean by that is that you have a proper kind of multifaceted view of your products and services because they are complex and to oversimplify them to a single number is to not do them justice. Uh, and more than that, doing so will often leave you kind of blind to opportunities or the real problem that actually needs addressing in the first place. The next one is all the time, but always try to break down organizational silos. If you're in charge of CX or design, it's not your job to own CX or design. It's your job to integrate the philosophy and the methodology into the wider business and make sure it's actually the driving force of change. Um, socializing values. If you do something right, kind of shout about it. If you do something wrong, talk about it. Maybe don't shout about it quite as loud. But socialize what it is you bring to the table within the business. That does not mean a KPI dashboard because nobody ever empathizes with a dashboard. Uh, it's about getting out there and really talking about the value of what you do and getting it socialized across the business. Um, and the final point around challenging the status quo, uh, if performance is being attributed in a certain way, then don't be afraid to kind of speak up. If you have logic and data backing you up, then you're the one with the evidence. It doesn't have to be done in an aggressive way, but it's about being kind of reasonable and clear about the sort of correct way forward that the business needs to take. Um, probably I think starting with an obvious one, if I kind of close and sum up those points there, um, given the nature of what we do as a business, I'm obviously going to say things need to be insight driven, but the best design is that which is born from insight. It's a proven sort of fact. I don't mean that every kind of small change you need to do needs to have a kind of weighty discover phase attached to it. I mean, kind of start small. So think about change in terms of hypotheses, you know, questions that you want to answer and allow yourself room in the process to kind of fill the gaps of the things you don't know or to maybe validate any assumptions that you're making and make, making sure that insight is the kind of part and parcel within that. Um, link closely to that, I'd say that you want to make sure that you're holding your teams to account for the right things. The only way to do this is to create kind of traceable um, pathways in data and process. Um, if you think about what I said before, if every decision is based in a hypothesis, then you naturally begin your process with a tangible thing you're trying to solve. So if you can prove you've solved the thing, it makes showing that impact a lot easier. Seems very simple, but a lot of the time we dive into these changes without actually kind of setting up the rigor around them to be able to come out the other side saying that you've made an impact. Um, make sure that your teams can kind of take advantage of the wealth of tactics afforded to them in the, not just the design, but kind of UX, CX, service design, psychology, behavioral science, whatever it is, look to kind of make sure that your teams are tooled up in the correct way. Um, a great place I'm going to start is looking into kind of psychological theories, specifically around sort of utilitarian and hedonic motivation. So in other words, make sure you're designing for the head and the heart, because that's where the premise of, of great design exists. So definitely something to have checked off. Um, you know, things can be functionally excellent, but you need that kind of emotive pull as well to really kind of cross that threshold into a meaningful experience. Uh, and then the final point I make is impact isn't just about the uplift you get from successfully creating a change in a system. It's not just like an analytics uptick. It has to carry through to have an impact internally as well. So every success and every failure need to feed lessons back into your organization so that the changes that you make have an impact on your business and the way you actually work and your processes as much as they do on the customer experience. The customer experience is just the start. It's just the manifestation. If you're not using that to kind of test and learn and iterate on your internal process, then you're just going to keep tripping up time and time again. Um, so that was hopefully a quick sort of 12, maybe 14 minute. Um, if there's any questions, I'd gladly take those now. Before we jump straight into questions, I uh, just want to give everyone a moment to unmute and go completely wild for Stu. 
Thanks. Um, oh, we've got a question. Yeah. So from Pedro, uh, I wonder if you have any suggestion on how to measure customers' adoptability of new business models. Good question. Um, I think it's about like it's not necessarily a kind of single fix for me. It's about making sure that you do the right thing at the right time. So collecting information across an end-to-end -end process rather than just you know doing sort of proposition testing or just doing kind of UAT at the end. It's about making sure that you uh, test the concept before you kind of invest any any significant resource into it. So proposition testing is a fantastic way of doing that, making sure that you know you've got a foundation in. Uh, understanding that you're going to land on a susceptible audience rather than just kind of pushing stuff out there. Um, and yeah, just making sure it's kind of end to end, you're pulling it in in different ways. We work with a lot of businesses about kind of baking insight generation into agile development because the speed at which agile goes, it's quite difficult um, to pull in customer insight, but there are ways and means of doing it now, um, which make it a lot easier. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Charlotte's just mentioned, uh, she just questioned, um, are there any businesses doing this really well? <laughs> Not amazingly that I found. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's quite tricky. Um, because if, if someone is doing it well, they tend to kind of hold their cards close to the chest. I think organizations that are doing things interestingly that I like, the execution isn't necessarily a hundred percent amazing, but the actual philosophy and thinking behind it. So um, all the stuff that uh, Southwest Airlines does in the States, um, they practice on the premise of servant leadership, which is the belief that you look after your employees first, your employees look after the customers, customers deliver value to shareholders. Um, so all of their frameworks aren't about CX metrics. They're all about employee kind of happiness and retention rates and all this stuff. Um, and granted, the execution, if you look it up, is not amazing because there's some union issues there. But the actual premise of it is really, really interesting because it's just a different way of thinking about it beyond just asking someone if they're going to recommend you. Like, it's just a better way of understanding the kind of impact you might be able to have. Okay. Um, and then from Sidlip, how do you suggest navigating the importance of tracing to the team and accommodate different working styles and communication to do this effectively? Uh, so if, sorry, for, I'll bring it up. Hang on. Yeah. I just just navigating the importance of tracing to the team. Um, I think it depends on the attribution side of things within the business that you're working. Like sometimes it's easier because bonus structures are built around um, being able to prove that you're the one that um, caused the shift. Um, but again, that can have a kind of political element to it that isn't isn't great. But I think it's just about you know embedding it into someone's kind of development as an employee as well you're trying to say let's track what we're doing to prove how good it is like if you don't have a belief in what you're doing then you've got to really question the kind of motives for doing it um and yeah accommodating different working styles is is really tricky but i think it's just about transparency and an open discussion um opening up lines of communication across different teams outside of you know production i think production just gets pushed into this box where they just have to wait for assets or brief to come over when actually the real value they can be bringing is right in the beginning because they're like, from an execution standpoint, this is going to work in a lot of different ways and in different kind of attributes for the audience that we have. Um, so it's just about kind of bringing people in earlier in the process and having open communication. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, okay. Well, we've got just time for one more question. Uh, it's from EK. Um, question. So you mentioned think of change as hypothesis. How do you shift the mindset of people when they go straight to solutions? Yeah, I think that's that's where insight comes in. It's about making sure that like if they can't phrase it as a question, like even even just the act of getting someone to phrase it as a question. Like I mean, there's common sort of service design methodologies to talk about doing how might we exercises or whatever it is. Trying to get them to not just be like, but we need a landing page that does this. Um, think about it more of a question and use insight to kind of size the need as well. So create that kind of understanding of, of what the audience base is so that you're kind of going. And again, it's that point about logic that I made earlier on of saying, um, make sure that you're kind of arming people to say we should do this because. Okay. 
Great. Over to you, Charlie. Thanks, Stu. Very Thanks much. so much for that, Stu. Um, so now we've got Charlotte, who's up next. Uh, Charlotte is an amazing service and interaction designer. Um, I had the pleasure of working with her um, a little while ago at SNCC. And since then, she has been working at Public Health England. And she's going to be talking us, to us about some of the work that she's done there about evaluating health products. Um, but she's also now working um, at Sainsbury's uh, within store experience. Uh, thanks for that introduction. So I'm talking about evaluating digital health products. So this is a project that I worked on at Public Health England. Um, and we designed a service with a big team. Um, so I'll just flash up the kind of the team that were involved in developing the service. And then, oh, and then I'll get on to talking about the challenge that Public Health England saw and were facing and what they decided to do about it. So um, this, what Public Health England saw was that digital health products aren't, weren't being evaluated with the same level of rigor as, as non-digital ones. So this is an example of um, why that's such a big issue. So Natural Cycles is a contraceptive app. Um, and in a Swedish hospital between September and December of 2017, 37 of the 668 women who sought an abortion there um, were using Natural Cycles as their sole birth control. So we can see that when we don't evaluate digital health products, it actually has a really huge effect um, and even though it's an app, it can have a really big impact on people's health. So how does that look from a kind of system perspective? It means that we have patients who are using products which may not be effective. We have medical professionals who are unable to make really good recommendations about, say, quitting smoking because they don't have an evidence base. And then development teams are unable to improve outcomes because they don't know if they're actually meeting them. Um, and then commissioners and funders are unable to make decisions based on evidence. So I think it's worth thinking here where you personally sit within the system, because when I was putting this together, I was thinking sometimes I'm the patient and I'm using products, medical products, and then sometimes I'm in the development team and I'm thinking about how do we know whether it's effective. So um, in terms of that um, kind of system, we carried out a big um, discovery into what was stopping people from doing evaluation. And we identified these three users who could be potential users of the new Public Health England Evaluation Service. So on one hand, we have um, founders. So um, they might be wearing multiple hats within their organization. So they could be developing a digital health product, but they also are making sure that it's effective. Um, and then the next person is the public health consultant. So they might know a lot about evaluation, but not necessarily a lot about digital health. So it might be about upskilling them in that way. And then a product manager in a government delivery team. So somewhere like a local council or Public Health England itself or NHS Digital, NHS X. Um, and a quote from someone was, I can do the digital bits, but I don't have the expertise to understand what's good and bad from a health perspective. So it might be about increasing people's confidence in that way. So what were the kind of barriers that people were facing? So one of them was about um, organizational culture. So um, this could be things like whether or not there's time and budget set aside for evaluation within your organization, whether or not they value it. And then also um, whether or not the organization has a kind of um, a good attitude towards evaluation. Do they want to find out if their product doesn't work or do they want to not know? Um, and then the other thing is evaluation expertise. So people aren't always confident in carrying out evaluation. So um, the sort of ecosystem of evaluation looked like this. So we had the National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence, who've just published these um, brilliant um, guidelines that show where if, you, if you're creating a certain type of digital product, what level of evidence it needs. Um, and then there's also the NHS apps library who are um, kind of being like a stamp of approval for products that have been well evaluated, but only if they're apps. Um, websites and other digital services can't go on the NHS apps library. So there was this gap missing, which is where um, Public Health England comes in, which is offering practical evaluation guidance. So a bit of a how to, how to get onto the NHS apps library, how to make sure that you reach those standards that NICE sets out. 
Um, so what we developed as part of the PHE evaluation service is a guide which one of our users described as a one-stop shop for evaluation of digital health and then training which is all about getting people set up in evaluation and teaching people about evaluation and then the last thing is community so that's promoting the evaluation service with talks like this, writing blog posts about evaluation and having an advisory group for evaluation who are um, across various disciplines and across the industry. So this service went through lots of testing. We had um, evaluation experts, I think one of whom is on the call, and also content designers who, also, who is also on the call, um, developing the content for the guide and developing the service. And then we had um, usability testing sessions for the guide, content design testing, because this was about bringing evaluation um, kind of expertise and guidance to a wider range and a different type of person. Um, and also we had pilot projects who carried out evaluation using the, um, the service. So um, I guess the kind of the thing I really want to highlight here is no product or service is too small to be evaluated. And I'm going to talk about how you can carry out evaluation. Um, so these are the kind of steps that we outlined in the evaluation guide um, that were developed with content design and evaluation expertise. So getting started is all about um, getting the right people within your team and making sure you have enough budget to carry out evaluation. And the guide um, outlines how to carry out each of these steps all the way through to publishing your results. And it's important that you share your results um, so that we can create a kind of evidence base of digital health products. Um, so I really want to highlight these three um, kind of key parts of the evaluation process. So if you get these three steps right, then you've got a really solid foundation for evaluation. So I'm going to kind of highlight these now and talk about how you can carry them out. So the first step, well, the second step is um, defining how your product works. So this is really important as a kind of foundation for evaluation. And this is a logic model um, kind of outline. Um, and you can download this on the PHE evaluation guide. Um, so on one side, you have your outcomes. So the things you're trying to achieve with your product. And then on the other side, you have your functions and what you're going to do with your product that's going to lead to those outcomes. Um, so this is a really good way of kind of getting the whole team on board with what your um, outcomes are. Um, and it doesn't have to be done when you already have a product. It can be done in the discovery stage when you've got a sense of what your outcomes uh, are. Um, and so we had lots of teams carry out the um, logic model workshop. Um, and one of them said creating a logic model is a low risk, high reward thing to do. So it was something that they found useful within their team. And we got lots of people in a room way back before COVID to actually align on your on outcomes. Um, and then define how your product works also has this other step, which is about indicators. So you've got your outcomes and you're thinking about what you're trying to achieve with your service. And then when it comes to indicators, you're being a bit more pragmatic and thinking, well, what can we actually test and what will indicate whether or not we've met that outcome? So with this example, this is the Couch to 5K um, which is a physical activity app. This is like a little snapshot of their indicators. So an outcome is user increases level of exercise by week by week. How will we know that we've reached that outcome? The indicator will be continued um, user engagement with the app shown by um, the app recording runs. So that kind of shows how um, an indicator can show whether or not you've met an outcome. And you can have multiple indicators per outcome. And you can also have an indicator where, an outcome where you say, um, we just don't think that we're gonna be able to measure this, but it's something that we want to achieve nonetheless. So that's outcomes and indicators. And then the next step is just de is designing your evaluation. So this is about um, what are you trying to find out with your evaluation and what data can you collect? So are you going to have to carry out further data collection or are you going to use stuff that you already have that you're collecting as part of your service? Which brings me on to the next step, which is choosing your evaluation methods. So um, we've created a kind of how to with evaluation methods where you think about what you're trying to find out. And then there's how to guides within multiple evaluation methods so that people can carry them out. Um, 
and they're really detailed. They've got examples. So with the valuation methods, you're thinking, what am I trying to measure? What am I trying to find out? And then what type of study is most relevant to that aim? You can have multiple kind of types of study if you're trying to find out multiple things. Um, and then within that, you, there's methods. So for instance, I want to check whether my product works. I am using com- I might use a comparative study for that. And then an example of a method within comparative study is a randomized control trial. Um, and you can see a how-to for how to carry out a randomized control trial in a lot of detail and really know whether or not your product works. So um, I guess the that's the kind of the the how-to steps of evaluation in short um and i wanted to kind of highlight some do's and don'ts of evaluation so um make sure that you build in evaluation from the start with outcomes and indicators this is about making sure that your product or service has a really good basis for evaluation if you know what you're trying to achieve and what data you're supposed to be collecting that will really set you up data Um, talk about outcomes with everyone in your team, make sure that they're aligned, Um, build in at least 10% of the budget for evaluation. So um, if there's kind of sometimes you're developing a product and you think we don't have enough money to carry out evaluation, but then that makes it sound like maybe there's not enough money to create the product or there's not enough money to fulfill outcomes. So always make sure that there's budget set aside and then publish your results, even if they show no impact or a negative impact. So this is about um, making sure that those learnings are shared across the industry um, and also acted upon. And then don't, um, don't develop a product if you don't have enough money to evaluate it. Don't focus on vanity metrics such as number of downloads. So this is something really difficult because um, it's easier to count things like number of downloads and web hits on a digital health product. But if you're trying to get people to quit smoking, it doesn't matter so much how many people downloaded it so much as how many people quit smoking as a result. Um, So it's worth collecting both and thinking about how to go further with your indicators. Um, And then don't be scared to carry out your own evaluation, even if it leads to hiring someone later. So this is about um, if you've got those foundations right and you've collected your data and you know what your outcomes are, then if you do have to hire somebody later on to go further with evaluation, they're going to have a really good basis um, to carry out evaluation. So um, this project is in the beta phase. And if you're interested in uh, having a training workshop, then get in touch with the valuation team. The email's up here and they might use you as a guinea pig. Um, And then obviously check out the evaluation guide. Um, I just want to really acknowledge the team. So there was a lot of people involved with creating the content for the evaluation guide and the evaluation service. There's a big design team working out how it was going to work and testing it. And then an advisory group. um, And we also had an external agency who carried out some of the discovery work and some of the alpha work. So, yeah, I'm very open to questions and comments. And thanks to everyone for listening. Thanks so much, Charlotte. We're going to try the applause again, but we're going to do a countdown this time to see how many people will unmute themselves and go crazy. So three, two, one. (laughs) Thanks so much. I'll pass it over to Afsa, who will do some questions. Nice. Yeah. Okay. So first up, uh, Emma, question. How do you measure the effectiveness of digital products or platforms if you can't directly tie your product to the outcome like if you only provide a part of the service for example yeah so I think this is um, difficult because the data collection is difficult so um, you're thinking what impact is is the bit that we're doing having on the larger service I think this is a mixture of things I'm obviously talking very in very vague terms not knowing the situation but um, I think it's about connecting with the um, with the other people in that chain to work out what outcomes they're seeing. Um, and then it's also about looking at what indicators you have just within that part of the journey that you can collect. Um, but yeah, maybe that's a bit vague, but um, that's all I've got at the moment. But Henry Potts and Flora are on the call also, so they could always add something in the chat 
if they think of extra things. And I'll, I and I'll share the email as well. So Sabina was asking about the email. I've shared that. Um, any other questions? Anyone else? There's one from Perla that came kind of throughout the talk. Uh, Perla asked, who is it in the design team that should be doing evaluation? So this is something that we kind of debated in our design team a lot um, because we were thinking, particularly with like a government team, they might have to be going through um, assessments and then on top of that, carrying out evaluation of, of health products. So I think that we... Um, we sort of concluded that if a product manager is really engaged with evaluation and thinking about what the outcomes are and getting the whole team to think about outcomes, then they can then start to delegate who in the team is going to do certain bits of data collection and who's going to be in that kind of logic model workshop and those kind of things. So I think it's the responsibility of the whole team, but by default that ends up being the leader of the team that needs to think about it the most. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, okay, uh, Harriet posted a really good question. Um, how do you have how do you have an honest, open, honest conversation if published in the public eye for outcomes that aren't positive? I think this is just about being brave. That's what's so difficult about it. If you're if you're saying um, we've done a evaluation of our smoking cessation app and we found that. Um, it has a negative impact on on smoking, people are smoking more or people haven't given up smoking, then that is really, really difficult to kind of admit as an organisation. But the more that organisations start to do it and start going, well, we did an evaluation, we found this was the evidence, we're going to change in this way, then we can start to move forward. I don't think anyone's kind of um, judging when somebody publishes an evaluation in a sort of negative way. I think everyone comes from a place of learning. Okay, thanks for that, um, Charlotte. Um, Henry, I, it's great you've dropped your comment. Do you want to unmute yourself and just, yeah, feel free to talk? Hello, world. Um, what I said was, if you're honest and open about your use of evaluation and you're honest that, hey, that version didn't work, hopefully people will then trust you and see that you are an organization that is committed to making things better and they will have more faith with your next version and with anything else you do also uh, obviously often the public sector is involved in healthcare and then the public sector has a duty you know the public sector can't go you know we're not doing this to make money we're doing this to benefit people if it doesn't work then we'll stop doing it we'll do something else cool Thanks, Henry. Um, okay, we're going to take two more questions. Um, first one from Rupi. Um, how do you measure the effectiveness of changes that you make on a journey which doesn't have an end goal? For example, it doesn't have a sign up to a service. It's more of a journey offering people guidance. What's your thoughts on that, Charlotte? So I think whatever you're doing, there's still going to be some kind of end goal. So um, if you're offering people guidance, then in terms of your outcomes, you might be um, looking to upskill people in that area. And then you could um, measure that by getting people to read it and then tell you some information, sort of um, that kind of thing. Or you could even be looking at things like web hits to see if people have actually gone on your service. So I think... It, whatever your whatever your product or service is, health or not, there's always going to be some clues as to whether or not it's working, um, and you can kind of like zoom in on those, whether it's going to have a kind of direct impact on a patient or not. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, okay, last question from Matthew: Is there a missing piece of the puzzle, a place for people to publish results outside of academia? Yes, I think there is. Um, I definitely don't think you, that everyone needs to write an academic paper when it comes to publishing results. By all means, write a blog post, do a talk. Um, you might even just be publishing things internally and making sure that you, um, that you iterate on that. Um, and for more information, go on the evaluation guide um, because on publishing your results, there's, there's a lot of guidance about a good way of doing that. So next, we have Dylan. Dylan is an economist at the Cabinet Office, and he is going to be talking to us about measuring the value of your services. Um, so over to Dylan. Cool. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. 
So yeah, hey, um, my name is Dylan. Um, I work in the cabinet office as an economist in the government digital service. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the, um, the importance of trying to measure the value provided by your services and how you might go about doing this. Um, I hope you find it somewhat interesting and useful um, and can answer any questions at the end. So uh, as a bit of a short outline, um, this presentation will go through three broad sections. So first, why bother trying to measure the value of your services and how you might go about doing this? Um, secondly, a few case studies of good services and how we try to value the benefits that they provide. Um, and finally, a bit of a novel example to show you how you can kind of try and get a bit more creative about how you can measure benefits, um, specifically in this case with regards to environmental benefits. So let's jump straight into the first section, uh, developing an approach to measuring service design and digital services. Before we launch into how we might measure benefits provided by good service design, um, it's worth considering what the point of measuring services is in the first place. So there's kind of three broad sections, um, I think. So firstly, savings and demonstrating value for money. So in government, we need to justify every pound that we spend. Um, and that's probably the case in most organizations. Um, so it's super important for us to understand and articulate the benefits of the work that we do. Uh, if we can't, then we won't get funding to do that work. Um, and trying to value things in money terms is a really good way of getting buy-in um, from people who may not necessarily fully understand the benefits of what we're trying to do. Um, if we can say that we're going to save X thousand pounds by doing a thing, then that's in terms that almost no one can argue with. Um, secondly, uh, it helps us to get support and buy-in. So it's equally important to build the story around those benefits and money values. So the qualitative benefits and other performance metrics are also really important. Um, the more that you can do to demonstrate the value of your work, the more buy-in you'll get. And finally, um, we try to measure the benefits of service design to promote good service design elsewhere. So that involves sharing learnings. So for instance, the project that uh, I was kind of working on over the course of summer this year, um, the output was a blog series um, to try and share those learnings. Unfortunately, that's kind of ground to a halt given COVID-19 where everyone, uh, all the service designers that we were speaking to kind of were reallocated and reprioritized. Um, but now that's all picking up again. So uh, watch the space. Hopefully a few case studies will start coming out over the next few weeks, um, some of which I will be talking about today. Cool, so how do we actually go about trying to measure the value of services? So the first step was to reach out to service designers across government um, and get some good examples of end-to-end -end service design. We developed a survey which we distributed across our cross government um, service design communities, uh, asking people to provide some high level details of their service. The next stage was a bit of a screening and review process um, and we were kind of left with a bit of a short list um, we then developed a, a short interview guide um, which we used to speak to all of the respondents to understand a bit more about what the problem had been how their service addressed that problem and uh, what benefits that delivered not only to government but also to users uh, i'll go into a bit more detail about what those benefits were and how we thought about measuring them in the next slide um, but the final part of this whole process was to build our model. Um, so after thinking about how we might measure things, we had to collect the data working with the service team um, and build any assumptions and kind of build out the model that would give us some nice money figures at the end of all of this. So here are some of the kind of key things that we're looking to measure um, when we think about digital services and service design. Um, the benefits listed, listed here are the benefits that we can attempt to monetize. Um, there are a few 
other benefits which are obvious um, such as shared learnings and improved collaboration between teams but those kinds of things are much more difficult to quantify uh, however they are equally important to draw out when telling the story around your service um, but we kind of split up the monetizable benefits into two key sections benefits for users and benefits for government so in terms of benefits for users um, that consists mainly of saving time and creating simpler services um, and to measure that we tend to conduct a bit of user research to compare the time taken before and after a service has been improved um, and then we multiply that up by the time saved per number of users uh, and then as an economist team at, at the government digital service we have some assumptions for the money value of people's leisure time um, so if anyone in, is interested the the value of your leisure time is four pounds 54 an hour um, according to our assumptions the there are also benefits to government so again time savings for civil servants so if three people save two hours each that's six hours of civil servants uh, time saved uh, and if their hourly wage is ten pounds an hour that's a total saving to government of sixty pounds um, and we can kind of value that because those people can now move on to do something more productive with their time there's also channel shift benefits, which refers to moving interactions from phone or email uh, channels to online. Um, and those online channels tend to be cheaper to operate. So that also generates savings for the public sector. Um, we also look at reduced failure demand. Um, and by this, we mean reduced calls to call centers for avoidable calls. So things like clarifying information or um, repeat contact. Um, and basically, if we can design better services, less users will have to call up call centers and we can begin to reduce the resources that we allocate to call centers um, and the time and the number of staff we need at those call centers. The next one is avoided duplication. So if we are able to join up services, uh, we can remove work that's being duplicated. So if we can look into the resources and teams that are doing duplicated work, then uh, by joining up and avoiding that spend, we can kind of bank that avoided spend as a benefit. Uh, and finally, uh, environmental benefits of digital services, and I'll leave this for later. Um, cool, so now I'm just going to go through a couple of case studies to try and bring this to life a little bit more. The first example surrounds measuring the efficiencies generated by the animal licensing service, service in government. So some context, uh, universities and bioscience industries uh, rely on the efficient granting of licenses to carry out vital scientific research on animals. Um, and that can be for things such as cancer treatments. Um, and we need to obviously make sure that those, uh, that research is done humanely and we have a really tight um, oversight process on that. Um, so the government created a digital joined up service so that establishments inspectors and licensing officers could all seamlessly share information um, on the service. So this led to various benefits. Um, so firstly, there are benefits for government. So um, given 50% reductions in processing times for each application and 30% 30 uh, 30 decrease in time taken to respond to uh, freedom of information requests and other parliamentary requests. Um, civil servants were able to save a total of 6,600 hours. Um, and uh, essentially we can monetize that value by looking at the average hourly salary of those staff. Um, there are also benefits to users as well. So there was an increase in user satisfaction from 68% in 2018 to 77% in 2020. Um, and I know Stuart mentioned that user satisfaction may not be the best metric to use, but that's the kind of thing that we had at the time. Um, and our second example is an example about joining up services to allow users to solve a whole problem rather than its individual constituent parts. So in our case, our whole problem is preparing to raise a child. Um, obviously, this is not a, a problem uh, in the kind of normal sense but what we mean here is that um, 
new parents might have to apply for three separate services in order to prepare for their prepare for their new child um and each time they have to provide some duplicated information so those services might be planned parental leave um, child benefits or child tax credits and they might have to provide information such as their name address income national insurance number every time um, if we were able to join up these services under a single account, we could recognize some significant benefits. So for instance, um, we estimate that it takes about six minutes for a user to in, uh, enter the duplicated information each time. So if they only have to do it once instead of three times, that would save them 12 minutes per user. Um, and if we scale that up by the number of users, um, 650,000, then we get to a total of about 125,000 hours saved um, per year. Uh, again, we can monetize that by applying that assumption that I mentioned earlier for the value of leisure time for users. Um, and the final kind of benefit here is a really important one, which is that not only do we save time for users, but we also make the process much more simple. Um, they're able to manage all of their services through a single, single account um, which uses some kind of personal data exchange. Um, and that obviously makes their interactions with government much more uh, seamless and easy. So the final example, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is around environmental benefits. So this is a bit more of a creative approach. Um, and uh, this is kind of where our thinking in the economist team tends to lead us, where we're trying to measure the value of things that are really difficult to value. Um, and this particular example was, was really interesting because uh, we were able to look into not just money value, but also um, uh, environmental value. So sometimes the stakeholders that are interested in, in the services that you're providing are not just interested in money savings. Um, so for instance, in government, we have ambitions to be uh, carbon net neutral by 2050. So specifically for this service, I'll be looking at the universal credit service um, and the benefits of shifting people online. So usually um, the kind of benefits of digital services have been constrained around shifting people from, on, from paper channels to online channels. Um, but we instead try to look at a slightly different angle. So to apply for universal credit, you can either apply online using gov.uk verify, or you can physically go into your local job center, um, and that's the non-digital channel. We believe that the digital channel has potential to generate significant environmental benefits because people don't have to physically travel to their local job center, and therefore the emissions and pollution created on their journeys are avoided. So how do we attempt to measure this? So our approach was that was founded on the fact that the majority of people apply for benefits by physically traveling to their local job center. So we assumed that uh, if that instead of, so we assumed that everyone applying for these benefits would do so online rather than going in person um, and then calculated the amount of saved travel time and greenhouse emissions that this would have generated. So how do we do this in terms of our methodology? Um, we first collected a list of all the postcodes in the UK. Um, it was a list of about 8,000 postcode areas. Uh, and then we used the DWP Find My Nearest Job Centre website um, and essentially created a little bit of code in Python which would allow us to feed in those postcodes and uh, find the low, uh, closest job centre for each of our postcodes. Uh, and finally, we did a bit more um, Python work to calculate the distance between each postcode and its local job center and its nearest job center. Uh, and the final thing that we had to do with this was make some assumptions. So we had to make some assumptions about the number of claimants in each postcode area who would travel by car, bus, train, or other modes of transport, uh, and the amount of emissions generated by each of those different modes of transport. Once we'd done all of that, we could multiply everything up and come up with a total figure for the amount of emissions saved if all of those people were to apply online instead of going in person to their local job center. 
So the results of that analysis were striking. Um, if anyone, if everyone applying for those benefits were to do so online instead of physically traveling to their local job center, we could save over 60 million kilograms of CO2 emissions per year. Uh, and that's equivalent to 60,000 flights from London to New York. Uh, moreover, given the carbon cost, uh, like given an assumption for the, the cost of carbon, uh, we were able to monetize this as well, um, which is again really useful in proving the value to people who may not understand the benefits of environmental uh, concerns. Um, and the value of that came to 4.2 million pounds per year. So uh, that's it. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope you found it interesting. Um, and let me know if you have any questions. That was fantastic, Dylan. Thank you so much. We've already got quite a few questions, um, but I want to give everyone a final chance to, we're going to do a countdown again. Everyone's going to go really wild this time. I'm sure everyone's been really quiet all day in the houses. So here's your time to just scream and shout for Dylan. Ready? Three, two, one, go for it. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks for that, Dylan. Um, okay, our first question. Um, so you mentioned about the value of hours leisure time. So Emma asks, how did you get to the value of hours of an hour's leisure time? How, yeah. How did sure. that come so, about? So there's actually a, a lot of research done on this. Um, and I think the Department for Transport do a lot of research on this um, okay. as they kind of look into uh, more efficient transport links. They look at, in order to like prove the value of those things, they look at things like um, how much time new transport links would, would save for people and kind of uh, the, sa the average salary of people in the UK and the kind of weight that by. Obviously, obviously, you're not working all of that time either that you would be traveling. So they kind of just weight that by uh, uh, surveys on what people report the value of their leisure time to be. Um, and essentially, we just in, in my department, we just use those assumptions. Uh, we didn't have to do that long, arduous process of coming up with a value for leisure time, fortunately. Okay. Um, nice. um, and then on a related note from um, Harriet, she asks, um, are there any other non-traditional metrics used to measure outcomes, i.e. happiness index? Um, so... This is something that I am really interested in personally, but has not gained a lot of traction in uh, government so far. Um, so I obviously, like we understand that the, the benefits of a service cannot be fully captured but in money terms. Um, and sometimes there's definitely an excessive, well, there can, be a, there can be a big onus on showing money savings and money figures. Um, what we try to do though is kind of, we do have qualitative and quantitative ca cases within business cases when we kind of pitch for funding for new things. Um, and we try to look at some of the broader metrics. And although we don't have things like happiness indexes, what we do try to incorporate is a lot of user feedback. Um, so, I mean, personally, I work with gov.uk a fair amount, and they have a really uh, large and, like, great user, user research function. Um, and they kind of engage with users to quite, a, to quite a strong extent. And they build up a lot of uh, qualitative evidence that way, um, which also provides value. Um, a good example of that is actually kind of COVID-19 related services. Um, we're able to kind of collate all of the feedback that, le that users leave on things like the vulnerable people service and guidance pages and uh, other service pages. Um, and those user insights will go to kind of senior decision makers um, in weekly insights reports. So those things do definitely hold value as well. Um, and then Carolina, um, she asked a question, how do you get stakeholders and decision makers to care about saving time for users when they aren't staff, but members of the public instead? Um, so in government, this is relatively straightforward because we kind of, uh, our purpose is to serve citizens and businesses. Um, and so we're really interested in um, time saving for users. Um, 
So again, if I go back to Gov.uk as an example, if we're able to monetize or demonstrate the value of time savings to users, we're kind of fulfilling our purpose because ministers and uh, senior decision makers are really interested in evolving in line with user needs so that we maintain public trust um, and so that we can continue to operate as this kind of single authoritative source of online information for people across the UK. Um, I would imagine it's relatively similar across a lot of organizations given that um, ultimately the kind of the, the role of an organization is to uh, serve its customers. Um, that may be a bit of a utopian view, but uh, um, hopefully like it's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's it really. It is a tough question, especially when you've got an organization that aren't exactly aligned to user needs. So it's, it's, a, it's like an extra challenge. Um, okay. Thanks for that. Um, let's move on. Okay, so Simon, um, he's asked, do you, ha do you correlate any of the locations of broad broadband access and mobile signals? We found that this was a factor when I worked on um, Universal Credit Pilot last year and discovered any other barriers to utopian figures. Um, so I... On the, on the first part of that question, I am not entirely sure, um, so sorry. Uh, that's not something that we looked at in our team. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, second part of that question, discover any other barriers to utopian figures? Um, so I'm not entirely sure yeah. what you mean by that. Um, um, Simon, would it be worth if you can unmute yourself and maybe explain where you're coming from? That'd be great. Yeah, no, I thought it was really interesting because I was involved with the move to UC pilot um, last year, which happened out of Harrogate. So viewing those figures was, was interesting, given like the lenses about being in a rural location and a lot of the barriers that came up, people could only get on one bus a day and they had to wait around for hours. So, you know, through that lens, I found it interesting. I was wondering, as you were going through um, that process, did you actually uncover any like um, pain points or any other barriers where you sort of thought like, well, this could be achievable, but these are things that get in the way around that. And so I'm stuck, you know, and I was using the buses in my mind as like they're an example of what we dug up because when you present that back to ministers, they're just like, well, let's put more buses on. Um, so, you know, did you come up with anything else that sort of come through your, your dive into that stuff? Um, so I think that that's a really interesting point about kind of rural um, areas. And I think it's something that we noticed, obviously, when we were doing the analysis on distance between postcodes and their local job centers, obviously the rural areas would be far further away um, and it would be much more difficult for people to access those job centers. Um, I think really we, the approach that we took here unfortunately doesn't really shed much more light on, on the kinds of things that you're asking because essentially what we try to do is take a like size of the, size of the prize type of, pro of approach where we said, if everyone were able to shift onto online channels, um, what would the benefits that we could generate be? Um, so that is somewhat of a limitation. I think one thing that would be, might be interesting is that we noticed that after COVID-19 kind of hit with full force and we went into full lockdown, we were able to observe like massive increases in uptake of digital channels, um, which is quite encouraging. Um, I think the, the difficult part here is that although we might have increased the kind of 90% usage of digital channels to access the universal credit uh, or whatever it may be somewhere around there, um, it will be that final 10% which are the most vulnerable people um, and the most vulnerable users. Um, so that would definitely, like, it's not something we've looked into, but it would be something that would be really interesting to pick up in the future, I think. Thanks, Dylan. Um, okay, we've got just about enough time. We are slightly running over, but we've got one more question. Um, has there been any, it's from R. Notto, um, has there been any Gov research into quantifying environmental benefits of reducing duplicate services, for example, reducing server usage? Um, I think there has been some research into this. Um, I know there has been at uh, the Government Digital Service where I work, where we looked into kind of the environmental costs of our own server usage. Um, and 
uh, I think off the top of my head, um, I think the servers of GDS uh, save uh, cost around like four million uh, kilograms of carbon emissions every year. So uh, that was kind of the kind of uh, it was the baseline that we were looking against when we were comparing the benefits of universal credit. So to give a bit of context uh, in our um, in that benefit that I just I presented, uh, it was 60 million uh, kilograms of CO2 um, that we were able to save in this kind of idealistic approach, uh, which obviously far outstrips that uh, 4 million. So that's, that's good to see. Um, so I think there has been some research, but um, not that I'm massively aware of, um, broader than that. Okay. Thanks, Dylan. Um, let's take on two more questions and then I think we have to wrap it up. Um, so from SC June, um, how do you engage the users in research who may be harder to access? Some universal credit, um, so for example, with universal credit recipients, um, she says she's not seen many feedback requests at the two job centres that she knows. Um, so I'm not super uh kind of involved in user research we kind of have separate teams for that in gov.uk one thing that i would say though is that um a lot of the user research and user feedback that we get is through those online channels so by shifting people online we actually are able to collect more insights not just through the kind of data analytics and google analytics of people's uses usage of services and kind of those quantitative measures but also as we shift them online we are able to collect more feedback as they provide comments um, and we can kind of analyze that using uh, natural language processing um, and things like that. So, um, but that doesn't really address the problem, as you mentioned, of people who are harder to access because ultimately it might be vulnerable people who don't have um, internet access or digital access that we're still missing because they can't shift to those online channels um so yeah that's definitely still a, a gap that we have i think um but yeah obviously as the government digital service we definitely are this is not so much our remit we're kind of looking at people who are able to access online services um but yeah sorry sorry i can't answer some of these um super well yeah. No, I have okay. one quick question, if that's all right. Sometimes I feel like it can be quite hard to remember all of the different things that you could possibly look at to measure the impact of your service transformation. Have you got anything that you use or come back to that are like prompts for um, different bits of data that you should probably think about investigating? So I think part of this project as I uh, as it was launched to kind of look at um, end-to-end -end service design and what the benefits of that that is was basically to answer that question because the answer was no um, and uh, really we wanted to try and understand some of the broad overarching benefits that we could continuously come back to um, so in the blog post that I, I wrote um, there is kind of like a list of some of the key things that you can look at which overlaps with what I was talking about in the in the presentation today um, so yeah that's kind of like this this is definitely at the start of the road in the journey so we had uh, kind of seven or eight really good respondents that came back to us and we used those seven or eight services to come up with those overarching and broad benefits um, but this is something that we definitely want to continue to iterate within the GDS economist team um, over time so yeah hopefully we'll continue to kind of provide these examples and provide more guidance um, on gov.uk and our GDS blog. Thanks Dylan. Um, you know what, there's so many more questions we want to ask. Um, what I'm going to ask, um, what's the best way of getting in touch with you if anyone wants to, yeah. Uh, I can put my email in the chat if that's helpful. Yeah, that would be really, really great. Um, okay. Yeah, feel free to just ping me any questions anytime. Um, so I just want to say a 
massive round of applause and thank you to all of our fantastic speakers this evening. Uh, it's been really great and it's been some really fantastic questions and engagement in there as well. We have another service lab coming at you soon. It'll be Wednesday the 16th September. And we're going to be talking about everything social design. Um, we also just wanted to do a quick shout out to anyone that's been kind of part of this or any of our previous remote events. Um, if you have any feedback for us on any ways that we can make kind of remote events uh, better or make the whole experience for you kind of more enjoyable, please kind of drop us something on Twitter, direct matters us. Um, we look forward to hearing some of your thoughts.